Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You can save your life by five minutes in this book in the morning if you're sincere. Deuteronomy 8 verse 1. All the commandments which I command you this day, you shall be watchful to do them. You know, you coming and parking yourself in a chair in this conference, or going and parking yourself in a pew every Sunday morning, you can do it every week of your life until your life is over, and it will not do you, listen to me, it will not do you one bit of good if you're not going to do what you heard. I heard this a few months ago, and I just can't help myself. I have to say it in every conference. We are educated way beyond our level of obedience. How many more Bible studies are you going to have to do on forgive your enemies before you get around to doing it? You need one more series that you need to listen to or get in one more prayer line? No, you need to do something. You need to do something. Well, I can't do hard. I can't do hard. You know what? Let's get a grip. God never tells us to do anything without giving us the ability to do it. Did you hear me? You may not want to do it, but you can. All the commandments which I command you this day, you shall be watchful to do them that you may live. I love that. And he doesn't mean breathe. He means live. Like really get a life and live. Turn to the person next to you and say, get a life. Okay, that you may live and multiply. How many of you like the multiply word? We like that. And go in, now watch this. I don't want you to miss what this is saying. And go in and possess the land which the Lord your God swore to give to you and your fathers. Now, what does that mean, possess the land? Well, the word possess, if you study it, means that you have to first dispossess the current occupants. So... They had the promised land, but there were people already living in the promised land that were enemies of God. So all this trip in the wilderness was training them in warfare, teaching them who God was, teaching them who they were. So finally when they came to the border of the promised land, they were going to be prepared for warfare, to know who they were, to go in and stand their ground and take what was rightfully theirs as children of God. And that's what I'm trying to train you for this weekend, to know who you are in Christ, to stop letting the devil rob you and steal from you and lie to you and deceive you, for you to know that you're not built for guilt and you don't have to live in condemnation the rest of your life, for you to know that God loves you whether you feel like he loves you or not, for you to know that he's got a good plan for your life whether you feel like he's got a good plan or not. No matter what the world says, you know what God says. You need to make a decision what you believe, and you need to determine today that nothing is ever going to move you off of it. This is where I stand, and I am not moving. Amen. I love that scripture in... Romans 8 that says, right in the midst of all these terrible trials and tribulations, we are more than conquerors. And then it says, sometimes we look like sheep being led to the slaughter. But even in the midst of that, even if you're in a time right now where you just feel like a sheep being led to the slaughter and you don't understand one thing that's going on in your life, you can go deeper than what you understand in your mind to what you know in your heart. See, this stuff gets in your heart, and you know things that your mind won't agree with. I know that 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 Jesus is alive, that he died for me, that he's been raised. Well, how do I know? I didn't see it. I wasn't there. Can I prove it the way we like things proven? No, but I know. Just like Job said in the midst of his terrible turmoil, I know that my Redeemer lives. 
It's so wonderful when you no longer judge things by how you feel and what you think and whatever emotion is flying which way, and you can just say, I know. Verse 2, And you shall earnestly remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these forty years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your mind and heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. Let me tell you something. If you won't keep God's commandments in the wilderness, you will not keep them on the mountaintop. Now listen, I'm going to say, success is much more dangerous than you think it is. You didn't all hear me. Success is much more dangerous than you may think it is because it's interesting how we pursue God when we are in trouble, but then when we get what we want, how quickly we forget Him and think we don't need Him anymore. That's why God said, I let you go through these tough years to train you to obey me and to love me even when you were not getting what you wanted. And then he goes on to say, and I did it so that the time might come when I would bring you into a good land that flows with milk and honey and you have every good thing. All the stuff that you're going through right now is training for the breakthrough that God has for you. But in these times of trouble, you're getting so close to God that hopefully and prayerfully, when everything's going good in your life, you will never be able to live one day without Him because you know above all else, Look at verse 3, and he humbled you and he allowed you to hunger and he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you recognize and personally know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay, what does that mean? Let me give you a practical example. Let's rewind to 25 years ago. Dave and I were just starting the ministry. I was on, I think, eight radio stations at the time. And, you know, when you're on radio or television, people can hear you and see you, but you don't know they're out there if you don't hear from them. And so, going to get the mail, and hopefully there being some letters in the P.O. box, was just like a major thing for me, a lot more major than it should have been. And every time we would go, if there was nothing in it, I'd get depressed. And so, a lot of times there was nothing in it because God didn't want my joy to be in the mailbox. <laughs> Amen? So, if I would go to the P.O. box and there was nothing in it, then I'd get discouraged and then I'd begin to doubt the call of God on my life. Then I would go through the whole routine that, we, well, this must not be God and I'm probably not called to do this and I'm just a crazy person anyway. Why would I ever think that I can preach the gospel? We're going to starve to death and what are we going to do? And I've quit my job. And Anybody know the... All right. I mean, whatever version you put on it, it's kind of all the same. And so, you know that you have great fear when you begin to fear your fear before you ever get there. <laughs> and so one day I was on my way to the mailbox. I still remember exactly where I was at on the road. I was sitting at a stoplight and getting ready to make a left-hand turn, go down the road a little bit, the post office was on the right, P.O. Box 655, same now as it was back then. And I just really needed some mail to be in there that day, I thought. Because <laughs> if it would have been full of mail, I would have had a great day. So I'm getting ready to turn, and I just got a little bit kind of feisty with God. And I said, look, all I want is a little mail. <laughs> I mean, this is not like a really big thing. The P.O. box isn't even that big. It would not take much for you to fill it up. I mean, I had this conversation. You don't, need, you don't have to get off your throne or nothing. You can just look at the mailbox and fill it up. And I will just be so happy. Could you not do something to make me happy? <laughs> 25 years ago, sitting at a stoplight in Fenton, and God speaks in my heart and says, and I didn't even know that this was in the Bible. He says, I am teaching you that man does not live by bread alone. And what he meant by the bread was the male. Man does not live by mail alone, 
but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, you know, sometimes when God speaks something to you, it's like you don't know how you understand it, but it just comes with a revelation. And I knew at that moment that what God was saying to me was, I am trying to teach you, Joyce, that your life is not in how successful you are in ministry, how much mail you have in the mailbox, what people think of you, what people say about you. It, your, that's not your life. Your life is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was trying to get me to the point where I believe this no matter what my circumstances said. Can I get a witness from anybody in the building today? He wanted me to believe this no matter what my circumstances said. Well, it took another good number of years to get me there, but at least I learned why I was wandering around in the wilderness going around the same dumb mountain over and over and over. God was trying to show me, now listen to me, in that wilderness, I, that's where I got to know God. That's where I had to believe God literally for my kid's shoes and my dish rags and wash rags. I mean, some of the little prayer journals that I kept were so childish if you'd go back and see them, dear God, please, I need some new wash rags. <laughs> I mean, it was God or nothing. We had nothing. I mean, it had to be God. And, you know, I so much wanted to just give up the whole thing. A part of me wanted to give up the whole thing and just go back and take care of myself because I was an intelligent woman. I could have gotten a good job. I could have made decent money. And so what's with all the ministry thing? You say you've called me to preach the gospel to the world and here I am, you know, teaching 25 people in my living room floor and <sighs> can't even get any mail. <laughs> and then, you know, Dave was still in the engineering field back then and he got a bonus every year on his job and I was probably back then $1,200 or something and boy that was our extra money for the year and we'd stick that in the savings account and I mean it never failed it would start to dwindle needed new tires needed this the refrigerator needed to be fixed the kid got sick and it would get down to maybe like $300 and man the fear set in and then maybe Dave would call and say I hate to tell you this but I had a blowout coming home, got to get a new tire. Well, I would go, I don't believe this. Every time we get a little bit of money, the devil has to take it. I am so sick and tired of this. When is anything going to work right in our lives? <laughs> now I got some relatives out there, don't I? <laughs> and Dave looked at me one day and he said, <laughs> he said let me tell you something he said as long as you are depending on that money that's in the savings account the devil is always going to find some way to take it away from you now he didn't say this but the principle could even get in the mailbox. As long as you're depending on the mailbox, there may be thousands of people out there that love you, but Satan will make sure the mail never gets to you because it's going to keep you aggravated. He said, as long as you're depending on that money, that's that little bit of money that's in the bank, then this is what he said, we are never going to have any prosperity in our lives. Well, I got mad. I thought, that's it? You're telling me it's my fault? Okay, I'll fix you. Well, I went and got what was in the bank out, spent it, and I said, good. I hope you're happy now. We're flat broke, busted, have nothing. And amazingly, since we had nothing but God and had to trust God, God came through. Come on. I learned in that wilderness the faithfulness of God. 
Oh, my gosh. You know, don't admire me too much when you sit out there and look at what we have today because, dear God, did I go through things to get here. Oh, my gosh. Years of going out with $20 that I scraped together and needing to find all, well, at that time, three kids, all three of my kids' school shoes, and I'd go to a garage sale with every bit of, I had garage sale faith then. <laughs> and that's okay, you know, you got to start where you're at. And I mean, it would be a miracle. I would find a pair of brand new tennis shoes that nobody wore, just my kid's size for $2. I was, this is God. <laughs> Come on, are you with me? And I'll never forget the day the woman showed up at my front door and rang the bell and she looked kind of sheepish and she said, I hope you don't think I'm a lunatic. But she said, I was praying this morning and I really felt like God told me to go buy you new dish rags. <laughs> I mean, I about tore the woman's head off. Oh, this is a miracle from God. Come on, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, can I tell you something? Stop despising that place where you're at right now. Because in some ways, it's one of the most beautiful places you will ever be in your life. Because you are coming to know God in a personal way. You're finding out that what's in this book works. You're finding out that God is faithful and that He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then God will bring you into the good land. And you know what that means? When you come into the good land, you don't always need Him as much. You're not as desperate as you used to be. It's easy to start not depending on the Word quite so much. Have you ever seen the little picture, or the pictures are quite abundant, of Jesus with a lamb around His neck? How many have ever seen that painting or that picture anywhere? Well, probably like me, for years I had no idea what that meant. I just thought, how sweet. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Little lamby pie with Jesus, sweet, sweet. But there's a story behind that. If a, if a shepherd had a sheep or a lamb that was rebellious and would not follow the shepherd, the shepherd would break its legs and carry it around its neck until its legs healed. By then, it was so used to being next to and close to the shepherd that it would never wander off again. Well, some of you right now have spiritually had your legs broken. And you got nobody but God, but quit whining about it because it's the best place you could ever be in your whole life. Because now you'll be able to come into a place where God can put you in the land that flows with milk and honey. You can stop just talking about the promises and you can live in the promises and you can live in abundance and have enough for you and more for other people besides. And you would not dare ever wander away from God because you absolutely cannot live without Him. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone. Your joy is not in what kind of position you have at work, what kind of social group you're in, whether you got to go to college or not, whether you're married or not. Your joy should not be in getting everything you want, the way you want it, when you want it. We live by the Word of God. What do I mean by that? Let's get practical. It means when you get up in the morning and you're in a pukey mood, and your attitude is, everybody better leave me alone. <laughs> well, I can tell you what, they won't leave you alone. That day, you will have more stuff going on than what you could even imagine. <laughs> so what's my hope? <laughs> <laughs> Why so downcast, O oh my soul, put your hope in God? <laughs> 
I will remember the breakthroughs that I have had with you, God. And David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord God Almighty. And on and on and on and on and on. And he will give his angels charge over you. And in God, you will never be disappointed and put to shame. And pretty soon then, you're thinking, okay, <laughs> I can do this. Because my word has been feeding my soul. Listen, you get a headache, you can go to the medicine cabinet and get an aspirin. You cut yourself, you can go get a Band-Aid and put it on it. But if you got a soul sickness, come on, if you've lost your joy, if you've lost your hope, if somebody's hurt you and you're so mad that you don't think you can ever get over it, an aspirin, a nerve pill, a pain pill, a Band-Aid is not going to fix that. But there is a fix for it. There is a fix, and it's right here in the Word of God. I thought, let's just do a little workshop. Let's just, let's just see. Okay, we just, I'm just going to open my Bible here to... Matthew 5, and I, you know, of course, I got all kinds of stuff underlined, but I love to do this sometimes, you know, just get a, what I call a little spiritual snack. But sometimes they save your life. So, look here, j just, just in a, okay, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you. Hmm. Can't stay mad, huh? And do that to show that you are the children of your Father who is in heaven. Go on to the next page, it says, do your deeds of charity in secret that your Father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. Oh, man, I can't brag about the good stuff I've been doing. I've got to keep my mouth shut and just wait for God. <laughs> and then I see in verse 6, God will reward you. And then I see in verse 18, God will reward you. And then I see in verse 25, stop worrying. I see in verse 31, stop worrying. <laughs> I see in verse 34, stop worrying. Now I'm in chapter 7. Stop judging, criticizing, and condemning others so you won't be judged and criticized and condemned. Whoa, what's that? Whatever you would like other people to do for you, you do it for them first. My gosh, I've only, I, you know, this is like, well, I could get my newspaper back out, I guess. And I could read about the skull they found and all about evolution and how I came from a monkey or I could read about what's going on in Hollywood or I could get in here for just, see, even just that few minutes can save my life in that day. Just that few minutes reminds me to be merciful, to forgive people, to not judge and criticize and condemn people. Don't be saying ungodly things about people. Do good things in secret. Know that God is always watching and I'll have a reward from Him. You can save your life by five minutes in this book in the morning if you're sincere. Amen? Now all of you that are watching by television, I want you to get a Bible, and there's a lot of different translations out there. You can get any one that you want to, but some of them are more easily understood for us today than others. I use an amplified Bible, but you can use any one you want. Just get one and begin to read it. And I want to encourage you, don't, maybe it's like, might not be the best to start in Lamentations or, you know. <laughs> Somewhere like that. You know, you might want to try the Psalms. Proverbs are full of wisdom. Or start in the book of John where I read earlier how Christ is the Word. And, and you know, you don't, you don't even have to be concerned about trying to read the whole thing at once. Just start by reading a little bit every day. But really approach it like, okay, I'm going to believe this. And I'm going to try these principles in my life. And I'm going to see if they work. God, I'm going to give you a try. I've tried everything else, so God, I'm going to give you a try. Amen? How many of you in this room today would encourage all of our viewing audience to give God a try? Come on, do you really mean it? They ought to give God a try. You know, as believers in Christ, we hear a lot about the Word of God.
But I really want to make sure that you understand that there is nothing more precious than the Word of God. It shows us the way. It shows us the way to live the life that God wants us to live so we can have the joy that He wants us to have. The Word of God encourages us. It corrects us. It convinces us. It even rebukes us. It chastises us but it lets us know who we are in Him. And that is such a glorious thing to learn.